Romans chapter 12, beginning at verse 1 through to 20. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one in body in Christ, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them, if prophecy, in proportion to our faith, if service, in our serving, the one who teaches, in his teaching, the one who exhorts, in his exhortation, the one who contributes, in generosity, the one who leads, with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy, with cheerfulness. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with brotherly affection, outdo one another in showing honour, do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice, and weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honourable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written... Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Well, welcome back, everyone. Sometimes when you uh, read through the Bible, there's great merit in reading through verse by verse. And you'll see good things when you do it that way, and uh, you'll be delighted by good things along the way. Uh, So that's one way in which you can read the Bible. Uh, Another way to read the Bible is that you can read it in big chunks and step back, as it were, and see a big picture and see a big God in that big picture. And so that way also has merit and sometimes you'll see such big things that they'll uh, really fill your heart and fill your mind uh, with great delight in the things that you see. Uh, I think that Mark expects you to do that as you read through his gospel. In one part of his gospel he puts four stories together, one after the other, that if you don't read in a big chunk you sort of miss out, I think, on the big thing that he's trying to say. You'll know the stories... Uh, I wonder if you've noticed, the, the, I wonder if you've put them together and seen the big picture. The stories um, start, start at the end of chapter 4, when uh, Jesus and his disciples head down to the Sea of Galilee, and they get into a boat, and you'll know Jesus falls asleep, 
and while he's asleep, a great storm rolls in, so much so that the, the disciples who were sailors and knew something of what it is and knew something about when to be frightened in, on the Sea of Galilee were terrified for their life. And so they wake Jesus up and say, don't you care if we drown? And Jesus stands on the stern of the boat and says to the wind and the waves, be quiet, stop talking. Now, if you've ever been at school and been a naughty boy or a naughty girl and your teacher has stood you behind your desk, you'll know, you'll know the sort of thing that happens. It's called a rebuke. Jesus rebuked the wind and the waves. Just like your teacher would have rebuked you. Stop talking. The only difference is uh, Jesus is not doing it to a year five student, but to the raging wind and the waves, and they obey him. And everyone on the boat that day was terrified at the power that they saw in the person who wielded it. The story continues because they cross to the other side of the lake and uh, there they are on a place called um, the region of the Gerasians. And a man comes straight down towards Jesus. Uh, This man has a particular name, uh, a name given to him by the demons that live within him. And he no longer is in control even of his own speech. And so they give him the name Legion. And in the Roman army, a legion consisted of something like 6,000 troops. And so maybe there were 6,000 demons in this man. You could not be in a worse situation than this man. He lives in the graveyard. He cuts himself with rocks and stones. Uh, No one can tie him up, even with chains. And when he stands before Jesus, Jesus looks at him and says to the demons, get out. And in an instant, they are gone. And the man is normal and those who see him can't believe the change that they see that has taken place in him. He was a slave and now he is free. A little while later there is a lady, 12 years, she has been uh, bleeding and uh, she has seen doctors who haven't been able to help her. She is sick but more than that she is unclean because of the bleeding and therefore she can't go to uh, the temple And so for 12 years, she has not worshipped God in the way in which she would have loved. And she hears that Jesus is coming to the town, and so she believes in her heart uh, that if she was just to touch Jesus, then that would be enough to heal her. Uh, But I think she believes that if she confronted Jesus, he would not want to touch her because she is unclean. So she comes up with a plan, and her plan is to do it all in secret in the crowd hidden in plain sight. And so she sneaks up on Jesus in the crowd and touches his cloak. And in that instant, uh, she is healed. And Jesus stops and says, who is it that touched me? And in her fear and trembling, she confesses everything and says, it was me. And she discovers that Jesus is the one who delights to touch the unclean and to make them well. And uh, he says, your faith has made you well. And she goes, right, clean, healed. While this is happening, Jesus arrives at uh, Jairus' place where his daughter has just died. She is 12 years old. Connection with the woman. Uh, She lies on the bed. Death has now overtaken her and life has left her. Jesus simply says to her, little girl, I say to you, get up. And she does. And it is as easy for Jesus to wake this little girl from death as it is for you and I to wake someone from sleep. And everyone who was there was amazed, so much so that they forgot to feed the poor little girl. And Jesus had to remind her, remind them to do that. Story after story all go together and you suddenly realise that when you have Jesus, you have someone who can tell storms what to do and they obey him. You've got someone who can tell demons what to do and they obey him. You've got someone who can tell sickness what to do and it obeys him. You've got someone who can tell death what to do and it obeys him. Uh, The Bible has a radical and earth-shaking message about Jesus Christ. It says Jesus Christ is not just a human being, not merely a famous religious teacher, but rather he is Lord of the whole universe. 
and there is not a thing in this universe that does not obey him when he speaks, that he does not own and that he does not tell what to do, moment by moment, instant by instant. And it's really quite overwhelming when you see it in that way. And I think that's why um, that saying, that little quote by Abraham, Abraham Kuyper, uh, resonates with Christians everywhere. There is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. Jesus himself, I think, says, be under no illusions, friends. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, he says. Now, that, uh, that is a message with profound implications for everyone living on the face of the earth. It has implications for what we think and for what we do and how we live and how we act when we're with people, when we're by ourselves, in our thoughts, in our actions. All of life, every part of life, is in service to this king. There is no part of our lives over which he does not lay claim, which he does not say, mine. We might say, uh, all of life is lived in worship of this king. And I think that's the point uh, that Paul is making here in, in Romans 12, when he says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. When you see Jesus for all that he is, and you see that he is Lord of all, and you see Jesus for all that he has done, and his work in salvation and the mercies that you receive because of that, then all of life, every part of life, becomes spiritual worship. Nothing is excluded. Nothing is separate. Now, uh, you might say at this point, well, that's old news. Um, that's certainly what we've heard before. But it's not the way people have seen things through history and it's certainly not the way people see things today. By the time of the Reformation in the 1500s, Roman Catholicism had created a sort of divided world in which everyone lived. Um, they, as it were, there was a, there was a great wall um, that separated life into two parts. On, on one side of life were those things that were sacred and holy. Um, there were holy people, the priests. There were holy places, um, church buildings, and the little altar that they had up the front. There were holy days on which you did holy things. On the other side of this wall were secular Stuff, second rate things, it really didn't count with God at all. Things like, well, manual labour, that's, that's hardly up there, is it? Um, playing sport, um, learning maths. I mean, that should, have, that should have triggered that there was something wrong with that thinking. Knitting jumpers. You could worship God via the, via, via the sacred things, the holy things. But the secular things had absolutely no value uh, unless, of course, you sold the jumpers and gave the money to the church or something like that. Being a preacher or a missionary, well, that, that mattered. That really mattered. Being a truck driver or an accountant or a painter, that didn't matter at all. Praying with your kids, well, that mattered. Changing nappies didn't matter. Playing with them didn't matter. Learning the Bible, well, that mattered. Learning science, that didn't matter. Painting a portrait of Christ on the cross, well, that mattered. That was a good use 
of paints and canvases. Painting a sunset, that didn't matter. And the result is that uh, life split in this, in this way and there was a whole section of your life that was not significant in any way and was not important because, uh, because this holy side, that was the important stuff. This stuff over here didn't matter. Now, however do you think it is possible to get to a point like that? Where life split in that way? What, are, what, are, what has to happen, do you think, to your thinking? So you think that way. And the fact of the matter is, whenever you diminish the lordship of Jesus Christ, you'll eventually get there. You'll diminish worship. It'll slowly cease to become all of life. And slowly over time, as you put Jesus in a smaller and smaller box, service of him will just become what's in the box and everything else will not matter. It's only when the Lord is big, Lord of all, that suddenly all of life matters and all of life is worship. And it's one of the things that Reformed churches loved the rediscovery of and embraced. So listen, um, because of the supremacy of Christ over all things, there are no holy places. Every place you go is holy. Isn't that a staggering thing? Because of the lordship and the supremacy of Christ, there are no holy days. Every single day for you is a holy day in which you serve the Lord with gladness. Because of the supremacy of Christ, there are no holy people. All people who belong to Jesus Christ are holy. Saints. Saints, you're called. At its heart, the Protestant Reformation, as Warwick said yesterday, was a rediscovery of the bigness of God. Big in grace, big in purpose big in sovereign power, big in ownership, Lord of everything and Lord of everyone. And that meant that life was big. Under Reformed teaching, the work of the farmer became significant. Music and dance and art got a new lease of life. Schools and hospitals were, were built. Mundane work in the house was now called a holy calling. Being a mother at home was a holy calling. And boy, if there's, a, if there's ever a time we need to hear that again, it's now, isn't it? Being a mother at home, changing nappies, is a holy calling. Don't you get a little tired sometimes when ministers say... I got a calling to the ministry. I think we need to start saying to mothers, can you say that as well? I got a calling to be a mother. Lest we, so we can brighten things up a bit. A holy calling. Marriage and sex were valued in a new way. Ordinary daily pursuits were seen as the way in which you serve the Lord with gladness in worship. All of a sudden, all of life was a life of worship. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. So you might get to that part you see in Romans and you say, well, okay, Paul, can you spell it out a little bit? Uh, what exactly do you mean when you say um, offer our bodies as living sacrifices? How does that look? And so he continues on in chapter 12 and into chapter 13 and he spells out some specific things. How do you worship God? Well, it's in the way you think about yourself. It's, it's in how you use your abilities to serve others. 
It's in how you treat people who hate you. It's in how you obey the police. It's in how you pay your taxes. It's in how you lend your money. It's in your sex life. It's on he goes, just everyday things. This is where you worship the Lord. And it does another day-to-day things. Uh, We don't have time to look through them all, but I've chosen just a few to touch down on. Uh, We might just consider these this morning. So can I mention them? Work. Can I talk about work for a little bit? Uh, And by work, I'm speaking about paid and unpaid work. In Colossians 3, Paul says, Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men. Whatever you do, that means, by the way, you can do just about anything. God is not so much concerned with what you're doing. He's concerned with how you're doing it. Now, look, there are some things you shouldn't be doing if you're a Christian. There are certain jobs that you shouldn't take on. Don't, don't run a meth lab. Okay? <laughs> Don't, someone giving up their meth lab now. (laughs) Don't be a prostitute. Don't do those things. But those things aside, by and large, there are no such thing as Christian jobs. There are jobs and there are Christians who do those jobs in a wonderfully Christian way. And so all of a sudden, being a plumber becomes a spiritual activity. If you're a Christian, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart. It's working for the Lord, not for men. All of a sudden, that history assessment is a spiritual activity. If you're a Christian, all of a sudden, mowing the lawn is a spiritual activity. If you're a Christian, if you sweep the floors, then do it as working for the Lord. If you're a doctor, do it as though working for the Lord. It's all spiritual work. We honour the Lord by the way in which we change nappies as well as the way in which we prepare for Bible studies. We honour the Lord in the way we dig a hole in the backyard as well as when we prepare a sermon. Can you see? Suddenly Reformed churches saw all of life everything because we belong to the Lord who owns it all and all of a sudden all of life is the place in which you serve the Lord with gladness everything is spiritual task okay well that's work what about sex Uh, in Hebrews 12 and 13 it's, it's really interesting the way in which the writer does this. He's doing something similar to what Paul is doing here in in Romans 12. He gets gets to the point in Hebrews 12 where he says, therefore let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship. It's the same sort of conclusion in Romans 12, isn't it? With reverence and awe for our God is a consuming fire. Uh, Offer acceptable worship. Well, how do you do that? Well, the next thing he says is, um, let me tell you about brotherly love. That's how you worship. Let me tell you about hospitality. That's how you worship. What you do with your money. That's how you worship. And by verse 4 he says this. He says, marriage should be honoured by all and the marriage bed kept pure. For God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. That's part of your worship. Now, can I say, I think it's almost unheard of to place sex and marriage in the same sentence. But you'll see it in the Bible. And Reformed churches have always had a high view of sex because God has a high view of sex. Now, I think we live in a culture that would say, no, no, no. We have a high view of sex. But do you think that's right? I mean, we live in a culture where sex is payment for a casual night out. We live in a culture where pornography is all over the internet and only growing. We live in a culture 
where we pretend that sex between two men and between two women is the same as that between a husband and a wife. We live in a culture that uses sex to advertise movies and music and all sorts of other things and manipulate us. We live in a culture where women dress so immodestly and pretend it's not sexual. Do you think that makes sex precious? Does our culture really believe that sex is precious? When, when I uh, lived in Sydney, so I, I studied in Sydney, and uh, one of the, for, for a time, for a time while I was there, I had access to a car, a brown Chrysler Valiant V8. It was about 6,000 years old. And when you drove into the fuel station to get fuel, you filled it up with fuel and you filled it up with oil. It burnt both at roughly the same rate, which was a very quick rate, can I suggest. Um, from time to time, people would say, can I borrow it? And I would say, absolutely. They would say, I'm not a very good driver. I'd say, that's fine. It'd be hard to put another dent in this one, I would have thought. Now, if on the other hand, I happen to have a Jaguar XJ220 6.2 litre V12 in mint condition, and a person came up to me and said, can I borrow it? I would say, there is no way you are going to touch my Jaguar. It is far too precious just to give this out to anyone. You see... Our culture views sex like an old dented Chrysler Valiant and it says lend it out to anyone because it doesn't really matter. God says sex is far too precious a gift for that. It is for marriage between a husband and a wife and that is how you worship me. It's that precious. You know, more and more as we speak into that space as a church, we get told, why is it that churches are so concerned with sex? I don't think it is that churches, reformed churches, are particularly overly concerned with sex. But we live in a culture that has it so wrong and is so concerned with it that we take every opportunity we can to say it's more precious than you know. It's more wonderful than you know. You've got it wrong, you know. There's another way, you know. That's what Reformed churches have always done. And I think the day might come when they're the only ones left saying it. When you have a big God, then you have a big view of sex and how precious it is. And it's going to mean, as we speak into our culture, that we'll be out of step. But that's not the question, is it? It's a matter of life worship. And we'll say to our culture, there's a better way. Three. Love. Paul picks this up. That's one of the things he picks up in chapter 12. And then when he goes into chapter 13, picking up other ways in which we worship. But in verse 9, he picks up love. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. He's talking about us here. Outdo one another in showing honour. Do not be sloth, slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. What's another way in which we worship the, the Lord who owns everything? It's seen in the way we love each other here this morning. It'll be seen this morning. When I belong to Jesus, it shows in the way in which I love those he's put here with me. Love must be genuine. Unhypocritical is the word. So I don't try and make a good impression. 
or look better on the outside than I am on the inside. I don't pretend to try and win your approval. Love one another with brotherly affection. I have such a deep bond in, we have such a deep bond in Jesus that I honour you and I'm careful in the way in which I speak about you and I defend you and I re- rejoice with you and I weep with you. Contribute to the needs of the saints. I'm not blind to your needs or your not willing to pass you off quickly. We're generous with what God has given to us. Seek to show hospitality. The words, the words are chase after, chase after love for the stranger. Not waiting till I'm forced to be kind, but looking for opportunities and being inventive. It's... Uh, the way in which we worship the Lord who made it all. It's so ordinary, isn't it? But it's extraordinary. You won't see love like that anywhere else. When you've got a big God, every part of your life is impacted. And the way in which we love each other here this morning will matter. There is not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. That one, Im- that one idea impacts so much of our life and our church life. But let me, f- let me finish on this. Uh, that, that idea uh, has driven reformed churches in regards to their thinking about evangelism, I think more than perhaps any other. And it's worth stopping and just thinking about that for a little bit. That Jesus is Lord over everything and everyone, we are absolutely convinced of. And it is a terrible travesty of the truth that there is a person anywhere on this planet who does not bend the knee before the one to whom they owe everything. And so we will tell everyone who will listen, And we will say over and over again, stop worshipping anything else when you stand before the sovereign Lord of all who is your king, before whom you owe everything. Come bow the knee with us before your king. I have had the privilege of visiting the South Island of New Zealand and I would have to say not having travelled to many countries, but in, I would say it is probably one of the most beautiful countries that God has made. One of the things we did while we were there is hike our way up to Franz Joseph Glacier, which I would suggest you do if you ever happen to be in the area. When you reach it, uh, there is a wall of ice some 300 metres high with Tons of ice stacked up behind it, creeping its way slowly down the valley, carving its way through the solid rock, forming and sculpting the valley that you see. It's like God's paintbrush. And the forces in play for that glacier are just staggering. While we were there, marvelling, I saw a child watching a movie on their mother's iPhone. No, I didn't do anything. But it was hard. Every part of me wanted to say, put the phone down. Stop watching the movie. Look at the grandeur before you. How can you ignore that? That's the reason we evangelise, isn't it? We live in a world where people stand before the sovereign Lord of everything, before whom they owe everything, and they're too busy because they're looking at themselves, photos of themselves, or photos of their family, or photos of their money, and having a little worship 
where before them stands the Lord of everything, their God, their King. And we can't help ourselves. We have to say something. We have to say, stop. Stop looking at those things. Stop worshipping those things. You stand before your King. Come bend your knee with us. There is no square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine, including you. And look, we won't care if people tell Trinity Church to be quiet, will we? I mean, our current culture says churches like us should really stop talking about Jesus. We should keep Jesus to ourselves. They say in modern Western culture, just keep religion private. Life is to be secular, a realm where Jesus makes no difference. They say, in effect, to keep Jesus out of business and work and education and science and technology and government and sex and politics and entertainment and media and the arts. But reformed churches and reformed people, they simply can't do that. We've seen how big the Lord is. We know that he owns it all. Jesus is already Lord in every one of those areas. He's already there in his divine authority and power and presence. You can't keep him out. It makes no sense. And why would we ever want to? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, open our eyes again to the bigness and the greatness of the sovereign Lord Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords. So fill our minds and our hearts with the knowledge that there is no square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. And therefore, make us worship in every area of our life, we pray. In his name. Amen.